have to say this is a great pleasure to see so many people here today because um, the last few years it's been a bit rough with the number of people turning up for first time contribution not being that many. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. It means a lot. I think uh, still a few people wandering in. There's plenty of room here at the front if anyone's looking for space. OK, I guess I will get started. So good morning, everyone. My name is Chris. Um, I appear on Drupal.org as Chris Dark. That's my surname. And there's various other mentors around the room. There's there, over there. Anybody with a green T-shirt is a mentor, apart from this tag one guy over here. He's not. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's room up here at the front if you want. Um, so languages I speak are English and Spanish. So if you don't understand something in English, you can ask me in Spanish. But if you're asking me in French, I can't help you. So one of the first tools that we want everybody to get set up with is Slack. So is anyone here not got Slack installed on their computer or on their phone? OK. OK, so you don't want to use Slack. Well, can you use Slack on the browser, do you say? Oh, yeah, you can. I forgot that. Anyways, it, have you got access to Slack? If anybody doesn't have access to Slack, they can try and get that set up. The on the Drupal's Slack uh, account, which is drupal.org slash Slack to get to it, um, will give you access to all sorts of different channels for you know, conversations around Drupal. So there's, uh, for example, the Bug Smash initiative channel. There's the Contribute channel, which is the one that we want you guys to join up to now. There's the, um, uh, for example, front-end issues. There's all sorts of different areas. Composer. So the Drupal.org Slack is super, super useful, and basically critical for doing any contribution in terms of collaborating with others, especially when we don't want to necessarily be as close as we used to be, even sitting at the same table as other people you can communicate a lot better using the Slack channels than uh, sometimes with wearing your mask. So everybody, please do get onto Slack and get onto the Contribute channel. So that's one of the, the first things that we want people to do. Um, so why are we here? Why are we talking about contribution? Um, that's what we're going to cover first. And then we're going to cover the types of contributions that we can do and how we can start doing those. We're going to talk about the issue queue. If we want to use the issue queue, it's not necessary. Um, and then various other parts of that, like merge requests um, and the tooling and Drupal part. So who is this workshop aimed at? Like, Who am I expecting to see here in front of me? People who are new to the world of Drupal. They, this is maybe their first DrupalCon. Maybe they've only been working on Drupal stuff for like a few months. Sure. People who've been working on Drupal for 12, 15 years, but have never actually done any contrib. It's, it does happen. There's plenty of people who just, they work and they do tons of Drupal stuff, but they've never done contrib, and they want to find out. Uh, people who do do plenty of contrib, but they've only ever done one side of it, and they don't know what other ways they can contribute, um, they're also welcome. So that really does cover everybody, you know? There's nobody here that, you know, we say, oh, no, you shouldn't be here. Everybody is welcome to learn about contribution. Um, so why do we contribute? There's plenty of, plenty of reasons. Um, I'm going to start off with the whole premise of open source is for open source to work, you kind of need to put back into it. If only, if open source projects just sat there and people just consumed them and just used them and didn't actually contribute back, they would die really quickly. So 
it does depend on you. It depends on people contributing back to the, you know, to the project. Your contributions are valued. So when you do contribute, people really appreciate it. You know, core maintainers really appreciate people going and testing things and marking them as reviewed. People really want that contribution. So you don't think that, oh, yeah, I'm going to contribute, but no one's going to care. Uh, you get what you give, and then some more. So learning about the systems that you're working on when you contribute gives you so much back that you can then use in your work or hobby or whatever. Um, it's really valuable as a tool for learning about Drupal. Um, and it also just makes you a very integral part of the Drupal community. You learn to, well, you get to meet people that maybe you wouldn't have expected to meet otherwise. You, maybe you're on an initiative like a Project Browser helping out and you, you, know, you know Leslie, who's one of the uh, Aaron Wimble winners. Or uh, you talk to Randy, who's also an award winner. Or Amy June, who's also an award winner. You, know, you get to meet all these award winners, which is pretty cool. Um, but no, like you, you get to know a lot of people who are integral to the community, and that might be great for you if, if you're thinking about it personally as a professional thing down the line. Maybe you'll be on some project where one of these people is a lead on a project, and they're like, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, you helped me out on this thing. So it's great to be part of that community, whether or not you want to do it for selfish, selfish reasons or not. Um, benefits, uh, yeah, it makes you feel good to... to help out and people be like, hey, yeah, great, thanks. It's, it's cool. Um, it does move Drupal forwards. So all of these projects that we see, like uh, all the different initiatives and the different uh, new tools that are being brought out, uh, those things move forwards because people are contributing back. So uh, yeah, without that, they, would, they might move, but it'd be a lot slower. So the more people contributing, the more people doing testing, doing documentation, doing bug fixes. It just speeds that up. Uh, you get some Drupal street cred. Uh, so you get issue credits, for example, if you work on, on issues. And that shows up in your account. Um, and you know, as I said before, if you know people and stuff like that, it, you know, it's, it's cool. Everyone gets to, uh, to find out about you and you know, what you can provide to the community. And as I said before, the more you contribute, the more you learn. So you start to work on areas that maybe you didn't used to do. So maybe you're contributing in um, something of documentation that you'd never ever poked around in. And then you actually read up on something that you were like, oh, this is actually really useful. So um, yes, it's very useful for that. And in the past, it has been you know, seen as contribution is a, like a development sort of thing. But it really isn't. It con you can contribute without coding at all. So there's people who contribute in all sorts of other ways that never have anything to do with code. You can be a huge asset to this project. Um, don't think that because you are a project manager or because you are a graphic artist or a you know, press writer that you can't contribute. You totally can. There's various different ways to contribute, as I said. Um, some of the ways are just having a Drupal.org account will provide you some access to some contribution. And the other way, with the issue queue, there's other things that you can do. So with just your Drupal.org Drupal account, you can update do documentation on Drupal.org pages. You can do translations on Localize. You can contribute financially by you know, being a member of the Drupal Association. You can give back to um, modules and distributions through Open Collective and Patreon, which is another form of financial contribution. And you can share your knowledge. You, you know, it's kind of what I'm doing here, right? Um, if you have a Drupal.org account and you use the issue queue, you can do things like issue triage, which is going through the issue queue and determining if issues are still valid. Like what they were talking about in the keynote this morning, you know, going through and, and making sure that a bug is still a bug, um, so on. Um, testing merge requests, for example, on issues, uh, using Simply Test or Tugboat on the issues. Um, testing experimental features, so for example, field layout, which is alpha right now. So you can go and test these experimental features on your project and provide feedback about whether or not you find any issues. Uh, providing feedback on 
changes that are proposed. Um, so, you know, you can find some other area where somebody has suggested, like, oh, I'd like to do something, and you can go and actually test that out. Um, there's marketing materials, for example. There's a lot of marketing stuff that needs to get done. There's lots of um, other areas of documentation or writing. Logo creation, for example, with the project browser, they, need, they still need logos created for a lot of the projects. So tons of things that can be found there in the issue queue which aren't necessarily code related or anything like that. So as I said, you know, everything with the Drupal.org login. Um, so one of the other things, other than having the Slack channel signed up, is to get your Drupal.org login if you do not already have one. So everybody in this room, if you don't have a Drupal.org login, please sign up now. Um, later on, you might need to, uh, for example, have access to certain features, which you'll need to get one of the mentors to unlock your account possibly on. So it's great if you can get that done now, so then Later on, if you do have that, you can like raise a hand and you know find a mentor in the mentor contribution space, and they can unlock your account. Because for like first time account opening, it, I think there's like a time period before you're able to access certain features. But we can open those up for you. Um, so yeah, please sign up. That is, you know, not optional really. Um, and I'm going to talk about one of the first areas in which you can contribute. So Drupal.org slash documentation is a huge, huge amount of documentation about everything to do with Drupal. We've got the user guides, the evaluator guides, and the local development guides, and these are curated uh, documentation. And the curated documentation is um, quite formalized. And then we've got the Drupal wiki, which is like the Drupal 8, 9, and 10 guides and the developer guide and Drupal 7 guide. And these ones, they are a bit more free-flowing in terms of how they are edited. I'll go into that in a bit. We've got the API information. So we've got um, resources about all the different APIs that exist. Um, there's an API reference document which is built up from code, and there's other ones which are handwritten. And the Drupal.org documentation also has like guides and guidelines on using Drupal.org itself. So about creating user accounts, content guidelines, marketing guidelines, so on. So there's a ton of different areas of documentation that do need a lot of work. Um, it's very well known. People don't like to write documentation when they're doing stuff. They want to just get stuff done. And they don't want to spend half the time writing up about it. So it's not a surprise that a lot of these pages are behind. Some of them are behind by maybe five years. Um, so like, for example, this morning when I was up, sorry, yesterday when I was updating these slides, I noticed there was some documentation that hadn't been updated in, since last time I updated these slides. Um, it's just how it goes. So the curated guides, for example, for the, the first section I talked about, which is a bit more formalized, has a bit of a strict um, update procedure. You do need to create these uh, ASCII doc source files and then use the issue queue to update them. So it's not as fast and easy to update as some of the other guides. But if you do go through those curated guides and you see something that's wrong or that needs updating, it is updatable and there's a way to contribute to like that. And you can talk to one of the mentors and they can show you how to create these, these ASCII doc source files. Um, the community documentation is a lot more uh, like, you know, like updating any wiki entry. You have a little edit button once you've logged in and you've been approved as a real human being. Um, you get this edit button and you click on that and you, know, you can go and edit things. Um, sorry, go back to this. Uh, you do have to provide a reason why you're creating, making the change, and it will show up with your username. So if you go in and you know, mess around, you will probably get banned. So you know, make sure you're not, you know, make sure you're, you, you're sure about what you're editing, so you know, don't put in like, silly things. But uh, it is open to all users. Um, and for example, you might be reading some documentation about theming, and there's like, they're talking about attributes, and you realize, oh, that's a very old-fashioned way of doing it. That doesn't tie into how it is on Drupal 10 anymore. Let me add a, a paragraph about that. Um, 
Translations, again, super, super important. There's tons of people in the world who don't speak English, and uh, there's a lot of different languages on there which don't have that much support. Um, if you go to localize.drupal.org, you'll find a list of the different languages and how much the translation files have been translated. And in some cases, it's very poor. Uh, so if you see a language there that you speak and you think you can contribute back, great. You, there's a team for each language, and you can sort of join up and start providing translation files for these, um, for these languages. Uh, as I said before, you can contribute financially. So if you go to drupal.org slash association, you can become a member. Um, that membership is you know, part of what helps these events happen. So yeah, that's definitely a super great way of contributing as well. Um, there's experimental features, as I mentioned. So if you go to this URL, and you can just Google it, uh, Drupal experimental features. Um, then you can find a list of different experimental features that are available for testing. And you can go in there, find out about them, maybe create some issues if you find any. The people who are working on these experimental features, they really appreciate sort of feedback on the daily basis, you know, on, from regular users or as to their experiences with these features. And some of those experimental features, they make their way into core. Uh, I think they were talking about that this morning in the keynote. Um, so yeah, it's it's great if these things get moved forwards because some of them are pretty pretty important. Um, the contributor guide um, is an area where you can find contribution uh, tasks to do. So after these events, if you're looking around and you're like, oh, uh, you know, I could do some contribution, um, I've got an hour free. You can find a task that's a very short, you know, small task. That's for like a short period of time, and there'll be a list of there of different tasks that people put in when they um, when they know about them. They'll put in these tasks into this contributor guide. It's not always totally up to date. The issue queue is the most up to date thing, but there is definitely tasks in there, so you know you can poke around and see if you find something in there. Um, after we cover everything else in this workshop people are going to be taken over to the mentored contribution space that's across in the other side of the building. And the dynamic of what's going to happen there is basically as follows. We're going to find the table with other people, hopefully. Um, you can do contrib on your own, of course. We, we just want people to work together as a team when they're first trying it out. Um, we don't want people to be feeling isolated and like, they're just stuck on their own doing something. We want everybody to you know, co collaborate together and talk. And you know, it's, it's a bit more fun that way. Um, then that table is going to find an issue to work on. Or maybe there is already an issue at the table, and you're joining them. And that issue could be some like logo design. It could be something from the issue queue. It could be documentation review. Um, there will be something that you're going to figure out to work on, and there will be mentors to help you do that. So you don't have to worry about finding it. Somebody will be there to help you find it, but you kind of want to agree on something to work on. Um, if it is something in the issue queue, you'll be updating the issue queue and writing, hi, my name is Chris Dark. I'm at Pittsburgh uh, 2023. I'm going to be working on this issue today, and um, hopefully I'll work on it for the next week. You can kind of give some information about who you are, how long you're going to be working on this, and you know why. And so if everybody on the team is doing that, then the issue will have all of your names in it. And then you'll be automatically signed up to receive updates on the issue. And so even if that issue doesn't get resolved during the event, later on, you can keep at it. Or if somebody else resolves it later on, you'll still find out about it. And you'll be able to see your input in there. Um, and then after everybody's signing up onto the issue or whatever the task is that you're agreeing to do, um, everybody will kind of come to a consensus on what they're doing. So maybe if it's testing something, one person will load the issue in the issue queue and read the, the steps. Another person will load simply test to run the, the, to load up the environment and test that issue. Somebody else will be, uh, for example, taking the screenshot and drawing a circle around the area where they saw the, the bug. 
uh, and then uploading it into the issue, and somebody else will be writing up a, you know, a draft of, oh, this is the problem that we found with this issue. So everybody having something to do on the issue kind of shares the load, and it means that you're trying out different things without just being like stuck doing everything. So um, yeah, we, the mentors will be talking to you about all of this, so don't worry about memorizing it now. It's just so that you know what's going to be happening. Um, obviously, if you want to work on something on your own, that's fine. That's great. But you know, if you do like to work with other people, this is how we, we do it. And yep. Yes, there'll be Q sorry, the question was, is there stuff for QA? Yes, there the most likely will be QA tasks of various different sorts. Um, I, yes, the, once you get over there, the mentors will be finding stuff that you're interested in. So if you say, I'm interested in QA tasks, they can find something. Um, and during the time that you're doing the, men the contribution, um, the idea is as well that you keep the issue updated if it's an issue in the issue queue. So, for example, saying we have loaded the site on Simply Test and we are now trying to replicate the issue and posting that in there. And then maybe an hour later or half an hour later or whatever, being like, okay, we found the issue and we're creating screenshots. Um, all of these things, they, it might sound like a lot of noise, but it kind of shows to other people that you're working on the issue, and it also allows you afterwards, when you're looking at the issue later on, maybe a year's time, to remember what you did and how you did it, and you know what were the steps. And it's a good way to keep a record of it. So keeping the issue updated and not just you know working away and leaving it ignored. The, one of the other reasons for keeping the issue updated um, is so that other people who maybe are elsewhere know you're working on it, not to you know try and work on it as well. Um, and after this event is over, when you go back home, or you know, in a few weeks' time, or whenever you've got some free time, um, yeah, try to keep contributing. If if this issue that you're working on hasn't been resolved, or you're doing some QA and you're queuing something and it hasn't been finished, or you've got some logos that you've left halfway designed, um, hopefully you keep the momentum going and you can carry on and finish those things. Um, but even if you don't. Um, just keeping track of the fact that somebody else maybe finished off the stuff that you did, that's great. You had a part in that. So, um, yeah, definitely try to keep the momentum rolling. It's, it's very easy when you get back to your, your own lives to kind of forget about stuff you did at a conference, but um, we don't want this to be one of them. Um, so I keep talking about the issue queue, and some of you might know what the issue queue is, and some of you might not. Um, the issue queue is a list, it's a list of tasks, basically. They might be issues. The word issue might sound like a problem, but they're not necessarily problems, they're just tasks. So sometimes they are, like sometimes it's a bug, sometimes it's a feature request, sometimes it's a, you know, just, okay, we have a situation here where we've got two different types of language used, which one do we want to use? Um, so anything that's a decision-based sort of thing, um, any sort of task, just like you might have in JIRA, that goes into the issue queue. We are talking right now about the contrib, sorry, about the core issue queue. We're not talking about the contrib issue queues. But every single contrib module has its own issue queue. Um, during this event, we focus on core because we can't just focus on, on everything. Um, but every single contrib module will have its own issue queue. Um, so yeah, in the issue queue, we'll be reporting issues, updating them, triaging them, which means you know to go through the list and sort of check are they still valid, have they got the right details, etc. Um, creating merge requests, which is a Git process for um, you know basically requesting that code be pulled in, um, providing feedback. So for example, looking at somebody else's contribution and saying, oh, this is my opinion about this, this looks great, or this still needs work, et cetera. Um, testing, so yeah, okay, somebody made a patch, pulling that in, running it, seeing does it actually resolve the issue that was originally defined. So to get to the issue queue, you could go to drupal.org slash project slash issues slash Drupal. That's one way to get there. That will just bring you up to the full list of all the issues for Drupal Core. 
Um, and you can also use this bit.ly, which is uh, Drupal dash novice. So bit.ly slash Drupal dash novice. And that will bring you up to a filtered list of novice issues. So we go through and we try to find issues that we think are good starting issues for people to work on during one of these events. Now, sometimes these issues end up lasting a lot longer and become not novice, but they still have the tag on them. We try to spend time doing issue triage before this event to weed out those ones that have become overly complicated or that have no longer, they're no longer relevant for some other reason. So if you go to this URL, and I'm going to go to it now on here. Let's see, is this showing up? Hang on. Hopefully this loads. But yes, the bit.ly basically takes you to this URL. And you'll see this is with the advanced search enabled. I don't think, I mean, one of the reasons you need the Drupal dog login as well is the advanced search. I can't remember. It didn't used to work without being logged in. So if you can't see the advanced search options, that might be because you're not logged in. Um, but in there, you can add a tag of novice. And we've also added a tag of Pittsburgh 2023. So if you type Pittsburgh 2023, it should update, except it's not for some reason. Did I spell it wrong? No, there it is. So you need to choose it from the autocomplete. If you don't choose it from the autocomplete, it won't actually use the right tag. Um, so, and you want to choose is all of. You don't want to choose this one of, because otherwise you're going to end up with issues that are either novice or Pittsburgh 2023. Um, so that's how you would find issues for this event. But for example, if you know there's other tags, so uh, I think the Bug Smash initiative has a tag. So you might want to look for novice Bug Smash issues. So you might want to add, uh, instead of Pittsburgh, you might want to choose the Bug Smash tag. So there's lots of different ways of finding things on this issue queue. You can uh, filter it by things that need work, by things that need review. Um, you probably don't want to look at closed items. Uh, so there's a few different, there's, you know, there's open issues at the top. We'll find anything that's open in multiple different states. Um, but yeah, if you want to be doing something that needs review, um, then you can choose that, for example. Um, there's different categories. There's different Drupal versions. There's different priorities, components. So there's various different filters that you can use to find something that you think might apply to your skill set or your interests. Once you've found one of these tasks, you can uh, click on it and take a look and see what it's about. And the Wi-Fi is a bit slow, so apologies that it's taking forever to load. Um, maybe I'll go back to the slides while that's happening. Um, I'm going to show you in a moment that the issue will need to have, oh, <laughs> seems I have no Wi-Fi. Uh, that's great. OK, so sorry, I can't actually put it into presenter mode. Um, the issue will need to include various different elements as part of the description for you, there we go, for you to be able to properly work on it. Um, no, it's not working. Ah, OK, so the issue will have a problem or motivation, so it'd be like, the text on this menu item is not readable because the colors don't, you know, there's a problem with the colors. So proposed resolution, change the color of the hover state to this, or the active state, or whatever it is. Uh, remaining tasks, um, let's say somebody's already worked on it, and the remaining tasks are, you know, load this up on multiple different browsers, um, test, and confirm, set, post screenshots, and then, you know, write up what you found. Uh, UI API changes, so if it's actually a UI element, for example, you might want to post up, this is a change to the UI. I've discussed it with other people who are involved in the sort of general Drupal core UI team, and you know, they agree this is, this is good. Um, as I said, screenshots if needed. 
Uh, these are all things that you want to have in the issue summary. Um, if you don't have, for example, the remaining tasks, you might end up having to read through 20 or 30 different comments to figure out, oh, actually they have done it, it's just waiting testing, or they did do it, but there was actually a problem with the fix and it was missing part of the fix, so we still need to do half of the task. So having the remaining tasks actually listed and up to date is super important. Let's see if the issue queue is caught up. Okay. Um, is this the one I clicked on? Yes, this one. Okay. So, for example, in this case, changing the enabled alignments checkbox options to title case. And some of these saying, you know, here this is what they, the problem or motivation is. Um, ideally, this issue would have a bit more in terms of information up here. Um, so, there's no headings or anything like that, normally you'd have something that's a heading like problem, and then another heading which is remaining tasks and, and so on. So this issue itself, uh, as a novice issue, is workable, but also another contribution thing that you can do other than actually working on the issue is going through the issue, reading what's in the comments and actually filling in those missing parts of the issue description. So if you click on edit, you can go in and edit the information about the issue. And so, for example, here's the, novel, the issue tags, for example. But here in the issue summary, you'll see it doesn't have very much information. And there is actually down here some links about um, issue summary templates. And so if you open those, you can find out about what you should be putting into the issue summary field. And if you see here, there's an issue summary template, for example. So you can see, OK, problem and motivation, uh, steps to reproduce, so on. And so in this case, you might want to actually update this issue and put in those headings, put in the remaining tasks, put in anything else that you think is relevant to the issue. And then in that way, you've contributed just by updating the issue and making it more readable. Yes, it's just the Wi-Fi is a bit slow. Oh, it's slow? Yeah. It's still working? Okay, I'm going to try to get that sorted. I'm okay, sorry. that's okay. That's okay. We got the, a man on the internet speed. So, good stuff. Um, yeah, so... Updating the issue to make it more readable, to make it more clear what is left to do is in itself a very important part of Contrib. Um, if you heard of the keynote where they were talking about bug smash, you go through and you find there's tons of bugs that are just sitting there because it's not really clear what is left to do. And people, they're trying to find something quick to work on, they go, okay, that's just going to take me far too long, it's going to take me half an hour to read through. Uh, I don't have time for that. I'm going to find something that's more clear. So updating that. There's updating the, the, there's the categories. There's the status, for example. So in the case, for example, maybe it just needs review. So you change it to needs review. There is information here about the status value. So there's a link here where you can follow through and read up on what these things mean so that you don't put it into the wrong status. Um, component information. One thing that we don't want to touch is the assignment. We don't want to ever assign it to ourselves. Call issues, stay unassigned, please. Um, but then once you've actually put in this information, you've, put in the, you've updated the issue summary, um, then at that point, maybe you're going to say you're volunteering your own time, so you check that, or you're, you're putting in time for a company. So this ties down to things like issue credits. Uh, companies can get issue credits from work done, or you as a user yourself, you can get issue credits. Um, so when you actually make an update and then that issue gets followed through and gets resolved, you will get an issue credit for the work that you put into, in this case, updating the issue. So as we said, the format here is not really consistent with what we're looking for in an issue. We need more information. But once you've actually updated that, Either you or somebody else can carry on and work on it and go, okay, now we know what the next steps are. Um, so it's, uh, 
a great first step to get used to the issue queue. Um, so I'm just seeing where I'm at. OK. And some of these issues will have patches. So you'll see here this patch, and it says it fails at testing. So the old way in which issues that were had some sort of code or, um, or something in the code base were updated was through patches. And patches look like that. And this is how it used to be. You would have all of these line changes. So you know they're adding and removing lines of code. Um, we are no longer doing that. So the patches are still there. But going forwards, we are using issue forking and merge requests. So for everybody who isn't planning on doing anything to do with the code base, don't worry. You don't need to know this. If you are working with a code base, then yes, you do need to know this. Um, there is a whole page about uh, issue forking and merge requests. There's a video you can watch about it. There's tons of information. Um, but what you would see on an issue, if it doesn't have an issue fork, is it's got create issue fork. And there is other issues which do have an issue fork. Let me see. I think this one might. Again, it's slow. So this one here has an issue fork. And if you click on it, it will go into the fork in GitLab. And so you can see the changes in here. Um, I'm not going to go into all the de in depth how to use the merge requests and the issue fork with GitLab. There's a load of information about it, and we don't really have time to cover it right now. But in the mentor contribution space, you'll be able to find out about it. You'll be able to find out how to create a branch and uh, within your issue fork, and then create a merge request to say this is my res resolution to the problem, so on, and to also test it and check that. Um, but to that point, um, if this again loads, um, the merge requests, which you will hear mentioned, they basically just mean we've got some change that's happening, and we want to bring it into Drupal core. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what Git is, it's the version control system that we use to keep track of the code base. And that code base might be code, but it's also documentation. It's also lots of different things. It's not just, but we call it code base. Um, and within that version control system, you can have forks. You can separate out a new version of that code and make changes on that. And so what we're trying to do with, well, we, what we're doing with merge requests is you have your own separate copy of everything. You make changes on that. And then once you're happy with that, and other people can contribute to that, they can then you can then make a merge request, which brings it back into the fold, back into Drupal core. And so then at that point, people can test those updates and check the code, do a code comparison, check and see what's going on. OK, this is great. This needs a change. Um, it, it means you don't end up with like 50 different files, which is what we used to have with patches, where you'd have to make um, a patch of a patch and an interdiff that says the different difference between the patches, and it was a nightmare. So this is a lot better, believe me. Um, so as I said, with uh, forking and merge requests, you create an issue fork, which is within that button that's on the issue. Um, then you create a branch on that fork for your issue. And then you make changes, and you make a commit with a meaningful message. And then you can create a merge request, and then somebody can um, merge it into the project. So for these things, we do need some tools. So it, some of these tools are useful for development. Some of them are useful for testing, uh, for QA, for documentation. Some of these tools are relevant. Um, there's a bit of a gray line. Like Some documentation does require updates to code to update the documentation that's in the code. So whilst you might not know anything about code, you can still fix a you know, typographical error in a document block within some code. So it's a bit of a gray area in terms of what is code and what isn't. Um, so I'm just going to cover the tools that we can use for all of this stuff. If you go to drupal.org slash tools, you can see a list of different tools that are available. 
We have testing tools, for example, uh, and I've mentioned this before, simply.test, simply test.me, sorry. Uh, simply test.me allows you to spin up a, a version of Drupal with a given version, with specific contrib modules, with specific patch files, um, load it up on the browser, test it out. You can log in on there. You can log in as, I think it's admin, admin as the username and password. And you can go and do whatever it is that you want to try out on the Drupal site. Um, so for example, say there's a problem that you've seen when, and I use it for this sort of thing, when say for example, you've got one module that you've just installed and it's looking weird and it doesn't track with what the documentation says. And you're like, oh, is this actually a problem with the module or have I got something else interfering with it that's breaking it? So you can just go into Simply Test, spin up Drupal core with the same version you're using and just install that module and nothing else. And then, oh, okay, it works. So what else have I got working, running at the same time that maybe is interfering with it and maybe you add that in and, until you find it. And so it's great for hunting down these sorts of issues, but also if a ticket, if an issue has you know, oh, we've done all this, here's the update, here's the patch, because there's people still using patches. Um, you can then take that patch file and add it in here as a link and then confirm that that fix has been done. Um, so very useful for testing. If it's a merge request, you can actually spin up uh, live previews using Tugboat. So it's not always there. If it doesn't say view live preview, um, there might be a problem and somebody needs to go and press a button somewhere. Uh, there's some very smart people who deal with all of the background stuff that happens that takes these pull requests and you know, spins up environments and you know, creates these testable environments. Uh, sometimes these things do have a glitch. So if you don't see view live preview, then, and it does say that it's, you know, it's all green, it's all testable, um, then do let somebody know. Maybe somebody can go and take a look at it. Uh, if it says suspended, that just means that it's actually dormant because they don't want to have them running all the time. If nobody's looked at it in a while, it's just going to shut down until somebody tries to view live preview again. So there's two different ways that you can load up a version of Drupal with a fix in it to test it. And for um, sort of visual regression, for QA, for um, just review and tested by community processes, it's super easy to do and you know, it doesn't involve any top technical knowledge to get these things going. Uh, for development tools for actually making code changes, there's various different layers of, or levels of, of development that we can use. So DrupalPod is a tool that we've been using the last couple of conferences and it's great because you don't need to download or install anything. You, Okay, I take that back. You need to install a Chrome extension or a Firefox extension, but that's not very painful. Um, so that's one of the first tools we're gonna talk about, but there's other ways that you can set up tools. There's local development environments uh, that you might already have, like you might have MAMP set up and you've got your setup for that, or there's a DDEV quick sprint setup, which you can download, which will get you going as well. Um, but DrupalPod is the one that we want to focus on for these events because you've seen me having trouble with the Wi-Fi connection. If everybody here is trying to install Docker at the same time, <laughs> you'll be here in five hours' time and you're still stuck. And that has been a problem in the past when we used to have a lot of tools installed. Um, people will be trying to install stuff and three hours later they're still not getting anywhere. We want you to be contributing and learning and not stuck there looking at, you know, very slow progress bars. So uh, the Drupal, doc, Drupal pod project, I think you can go to, you can go to github.com slash Charles slash Drupal prod. Um, Charles is the guy who, who set it up. But I think you can also go to drupalpod.com or something. I think if you Google it, it will show up. Sorry, I forgot the URL. Um, and that will allow you to download an extension and there's also a set of instructions on that page, and he'll go through like all the steps that you need to do to get everything set up. It's very simple. You do need to have a GitHub account, and I know Drupal is on GitLab. That's very confusing. 
but the authentication method for GitLab doesn't currently work with this. So you do need to have a GitHub account, which it will use to spin up. Um, it's basically Git pod behind the scenes, which is a remote working environment. And it will use DDEV to install Drupal on that. So, OK. Um, so I'm just getting a note. If I do have issues again, I'd be asking everyone to turn on airplane mode. So uh, yeah, if I do that, just be ready to turn on your airplane mode. For now, we're fine. Um, but yeah, once you actually get the, um, the Drupal pod installed, or the, sorry, the extension installed, and you go to Drupal pod, it will ask you to authenticate with GitHub. And so if you can do that, yeah, you will need a GitHub account. But then after that, you can spin up a development environment uh, it will have a preview, so you can actually view the, the code, the, the site, sorry. You can share that URL with other people, so you can bring up um, a code base that's already there, an issue that's already there, bring it up on your computer, see the preview on the top corner, uh, share, you know, make a change in code, share that URL with other people in your Slack group that are working on the issue together. They can then also see that change, make a screenshot of that. Uh, you can share your workspace, so you can actually share the URL for the code, so they can also code in the same code base at the same time as you, all from your browser. Last year, or oh, was it in Prague, we had a guy, we were experimenting a bit, we had a guy do it on his laptop, uh, his iPad, sorry. So you can, uh, yeah, you can do Drupal development on your iPad if you want to. Um, there is Xdebug on there, there's uh, VS Code and PHP Storm are both available in this remote environment. So if you have a preference of those IDEs, you can use it. Um, and yeah, you can bring in, with the extension, you can bring in a branch of an issue fork to work on, or you can bring in a patch, and it will load it into the environment that you're working on, ready to work. Um, sorry, I got ahead of my slides. So yeah, so VS Code or PHP Storm, you've got private and public site previews, you've got Xdebug, shared development. Um, but do follow the steps on the Drupal pod um, readme, because there is some caveats. Again, the, using the GitHub authentication, not GitLab. And there's a few other steps there. There's a, a checkbox that you need to check one time. Um, so once you follow those things, pardon me, if you have a, tr a problem with any of those steps, or you, you get stuck, talk to one of the mentors. Maybe they, they, they'll be able to help you out. You might need to you know, go back and reset something. Um, but all of this is running on your browser. There's nothing being installed on your machine other than the extension. So if you've got a laptop that's locked down for work and you can't install things, um, even if you don't have the extension, you can still get this working. You just need to, there's another workaround for that. Um, but basically, as long as you can hit a URL, you can get to it. So for example, if somebody else has the workspace set up and they share that URL with you, you can just load that up in your browser. And you've not even installed the Chrome extension. Um, so yeah, it's really powerful for these events just to get up and going and get contributing. And again, when we're working at the tables with other people and we're working on an issue together, we want to be on the contribute channel. And we want to create a comment on the contribute channel like, hey, we're working on this issue, post an issue link. Um, and then within that thread, because in Slack, you can do threads within the messages. Within that thread, you can just chat about the issue together. So you will get into the thread, and then you can post and share links and chat. And especially when it's a, a loud room, and these rooms do get a bit loud, everybody's wearing masks, everybody's starting to talk louder and louder and louder. It can be hard to hear. So sometimes it's just easier just to type on Slack. Um, and in that way as well, Everybody else who is uh, helping out in the room can go and look at your conversation and see all the stuff that you're working on. And oh, yes, we can see in this chat they're talking about this thing. I think maybe they need some help with something. I'll go over and talk to them. So um, it allows us to, to help you guys and girls and everybody. Sorry, English expression. Um, it helps us to figure out whether or not somebody needs help or to actually just get a, a a feel for how things are going. Uh, we don't want these contribution efforts to happen in a vacuum. We don't want 
it to be something that was talked about in the room and then you forgot about it and you can't really remember what you were doing or who you were doing it with. We want it to be something that's on the record that you can then go back to and you can check and you can remember, oh, yeah, I was talking to this guy. Let me just follow up with him. Or I was talking to her. You know, like, um, so having everything on the Contribute channel and everything in the issue queue helps us keep a memory of that. Uh, so yes, again, super important that we have that. And then finally, we also do have videos about a lot of the stuff I've been talking about. So if you go to bit.ly slash Drupal dash contribute, there's videos where you can go and check um, how to do like things around uh, documentation. Or there's a video, for example, about how to use DrupalPod. Um, so you can go back and watch these videos if you want in your own time, maybe next week. Or you know, if you've got half an hour and you're not doing anything right now before you go and do mentor contribution, but hopefully you will. Um, yes, you can go watch those videos. And uh, oh, that's the wrong link. Please ignore that link. I forgot to update the last slide. <laughs> um, I will. Um, I can post these slides into the contribute channel later on. So if you go onto the contribute channel, I will post these slides. Sorry, it's been busy. Uh, but yeah, that's all. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, now we're taking questions. If anyone's got a question, just put your hand up. There'll be a microphone moving around over here. Oh. The fake mentor. Uh, what sort of uh, system does do, uh, does the Drupal.org use to keep track of the tickets? Like I'm, I've used Jira, but how does Drupal.org have its own system uh, it's for Drupal, keeping Drupal people, magic for for keeping people on track? Having so many, especially we got a whole room full of people, nine oh. issues to work on in the novice queue. Uh, how does it how does it keep things together? So there's nine issues that you're seeing right now. There's actually other meta, meta issues that aren't necessarily in that list that we create other issues from. The issue queue itself is a core part of Drupal that they are trying to move into GitLab. Um, but right now, and from, you know, since a long time ago, it has been basically a you know, uh, home-brewed uh, issue tracking tool. Soon, it'll be all in GitLab. Yep. And there you'll have Kanban boards. And you'll have issues. You have better ways of organizing. Right now, meta issues are our main way. That's an issue that has issues. It's just simply as that. And we have issues for some of those as well. And so we some, have issue, 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 issue. Those are called initiatives. And then there are initiatives that have meta issues that have issues. Yeah. And so many different ways. <laughs> We're doing the best we can, folks. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Nope. What is that sound? Uh, that sound the is the sound of your destiny, telling you to go <laughs> to the mentored contribution space and get started. Elephants. So yeah, everybody, if you want to go and do some contribution, if you walk that way, as in uh, down the hall towards the light, walk towards the light and then walk through the light and out the other side, and you'll find your way to the mentored contribution space. Before the mentored contribution space is the general contribution space. Don't go in there unless you actually have done it before because they're trying to be a bit quiet in there. Um, but past that is the mental contribution space. And there'll be Greg at the door. He'll be talking to you, finding out what you're interested in working on, and finding somewhere for you to work. So uh, thank you very much for coming, everybody.